What can you learn about the gospel from a dog? A lot. Stay tuned. I had very logical reasons for believing in things that logic and reason could never teach me. It's kind of ironic, but the more complexity science finds in life, the less likely becomes the whole scenario and theory they use to explain its origin. The really amazing thing is that quantum physics shows that nature at its most fundamental level, strains human credulity and knowledge in ways biblical faith never does. Hola. Welcome to the show. Cliff Goldstein here. You know, growing up, I never had a dog. Just a cat named Christy. We had it for years and years, and when I finally, I left home and everybody kind of went their own way, I took the cat with me, and then she ran away, and oh, I felt terrible, and my family was mad at me for months after that. It was only after I married Kim that I got my first dog. It was her name, it was Fergie. I was 32 years old. And, you know, I'd never been around dogs before. Frankly, I didn't really like dogs. I had a paper route as a kid, and this dog bit me. This little poodle bit me, but it really hurt. And I remember thinking, well, if some little mutt poodle could do that to me, what could a big old dog do to me? But anyway, so I was always a little scared. But then came Fergie. A little pug, a little pug. She didn't took too dangerous. And I was astonished. I was, because I'd never been around dogs. I was astonished at the range of emotion that this dog displayed. I mean, you could interact with it. You know, all I knew was a cat. And well, cats, they kind of could care less. They just, you know, feed them and then they're off on their own. They don't care. But Fergie was amazing to me. And, well, I really bonded with the dog. I bonded. It was, I was astonished at the interaction that I had with her. There was one time, though, and, again, I was, Fergie was still quite young. I'm walking down the stairs with the dog, and I had to do something in my hand, and so I just dropped her. I just dropped her, you know, a cat would have, boom, landed on its feet and brushed off and walked away fine. Well, poor Fergie goes, lands on her face and rolls down the stairs, and my wife looks at me, and she says, throwing my dog down the stairs? Well, anyway, Fergie was fine, forgave me, and I became a dog lover. Well, then after Fergie passed, we came Penny, a monster German shepherd. And after Penny passed, we now have Tessa, another monster German shepherd. And I just loved my dogs. And I remember I once wondered out loud, why do I like dogs so much? And I realized that having a dog around was kind of like having a three-year-old toddler around. And who doesn't love that? However, as any dog lover knows, those beasts can be a hassle, can't they? Oh, please. They can get fleas. They can get scabbies. They can get infections. They can get rabies, heartworm. They can throw up in the house. They can soil the carpet. They can bark at the wrong times. And sometimes they can even bite people. Penny had a bad habit of every now and then taking a nip at someone. You know, the neighbor's parents, my kid's friends didn't appreciate my dog biting their kids. (laughs) So anyway, anyway, and then when we go on a trip, you go on a trip, you got to put the dog in the kennel and all, you know, and and in some of the kennel here, you know, they charge you by the pound. You know, I take a hundred pound dog to the kennel. By the time I come back, I spend a hunk of money on just the dog in the kennel. Anyway, and then besides all that, sometimes the dogs just shed, shed, and shed. 
yet we love them. And I think it was worth it, though sometimes after this dog is gone, we think no more dogs. What though, what though if you could get a dog that did none of the above, a dog that did not shed, that did not soil the carpet, that did not get ringworm, it did none of those things. A dog that was trained pretty much to do whatever you ask it to do, and, and, but did none of the things that dogs did that you didn't like about your dogs. You know, you didn't have to vaccinate it, you didn't have to take it to the vet, you didn't even have to take it on walk so it could take care of its business. Man, that sounds like kind of a wonder dog, doesn't it? What, what if you could get a dog like that? Well, you can. You can get a robot dog. Go online. They're for sale all over the internet. You know, how about a wow we chip to robot toy dog white or any one of the other wow we chip robot dogs? There's an ad for it goes like this. There is no chip like your chip. Chip is an intelligent, affectionate robot dog with advanced centers and smart and smart accessories. Chip is always aware, ready to play, and on and on and on. There's all sorts of robot dogs. One site says, and then there's Sony's Ibo. That's another one. Sony Ibo, which means companion in Japanese. And it's the acronym for Artificial Intelligence Robot. And according to Ibo, according to Sony, Ibo is a true companion with real emotions and instincts. With loving attentions from his master, he will develop into a more fun-loving friend as pastime, as time passes. Sony also states this, Ibo actually has emotions and instincts programmed into his brain. He acts to fulfill the desires created by his instinct. And it goes on like any living being, Ibo learns to get what he wants. If not, he can get sad or angry. Occasionally, he'll wave his reg legs around to show anger if he doesn't receive the attention he wants. The way you respond to his emotional expressions greatly influences his personality. Even though Ibo is made from plastic, powered by a battery, he has a nerve and a nervous system of integrated circuitry. He is also a fully cognizant, sensitive, loving, and communicative companion. Now, come on. Come on. How stupid. How stupid do these people think we are? Instincts, joy, emotion, sad, angry growth, cognizant. You can't be serious. It's a machine for crying out loud. It's made of the same stuff as my iPad. Robots have no more emotion and instincts than a toilet gets vertigo when you flush it. To claim that Ibo is a fully cognizant and has instincts and all that is just is ridiculous. We barely understand how living tissue, brain cells can house, house emotions and desires. We're not even sure what they are or how they are, our body creates them. Are they purely chemical and electrical signals in our brain? And if they are, how can some kind of transcendent spiritual element be to there with them? And how does the spiritual element interact with chemicals and cells and so on and so forth? The fact is nobody has an idea. They're, they're, these things are a mystery and will probably remain so for a long time. And yet we're supposed to believe that Sony has produced a robot dog that manifests love and joy and happiness in a factory in some third world country where workers are paid a few dollars a day. They have created on the assembly line devices that have emotion, desires, joys, 
joy, sadness, anger, love. Just plug in the battery, charge it up, and out of the circuit boards and silicone chips, like photons out of light, will come joy and love and all these things from the robot dog. Come on. I mean, please, to make a mistake, a cute, a computerized dog wagging its tail as an expression of happiness would almost be like applying, attributing moral integrity to a computer software program that films, that filters out child porn. I mean, come on, talk about false advertising. Okay. Now, my beef, I'm not, I don't even have a problem with these things per se. My beef is with the advertising, which says somehow these things are giving emotions and so forth and desire. They don't, they can't. They're robots, they're machines, just as my iPad is a machine. No more emotion in my iPad than it is in one of these Sony iBos. Now, Let me ask you a question, you dog lovers out there. How would you like to exchange your dog or think about your childhood dog? How would you like to have exchanged it or exchange it for a robot dog? I mean, again, you don't have to worry about it soiling the carpet. You don't have to worry about it getting old and sick. You don't need to worry about vaccines, shedding, barking, bite, biting, all these things. All you got to do is recharge the batteries and voila, you have your dog. Would that work for you? You know, I'm not talking about a moment of frustration when Fido soils the carpet. I mean, in general, how would you like a robot dog instead of a real flesh and blood one? I don't know about you, but that leaves me kind of cold. You know, I have never seen one, and maybe they're fun. Okay, fine, I don't know. But the idea of it showing affection and love just doesn't work for me. Sure, a flesh and blood dog is just that, a flesh and blood, flesh and blood dog. But there is an emotional bond created with the beast, with the beast that you can never, never have with anything like a machine. That is, there's something crucial, foundational, missing, right? Now, perhaps you see where I'm going with this. If, like me, the thought of having a robot dog doesn't work, even though it won't shed, it won't soil the carpet, it won't get rabies, whatever, if that does nothing for you, That is, you'd rather have a flesh and blood beast with all the hassles, with all the potential hassles, and on and on. How do you think it worked with God and human beings? Can you see my point here? If the idea of a robot dog doesn't work for you, then how would God have felt creating robot humans who can never do wrong, never, to use the Ibo analogy, never soil the carpet, bite people, get rabies, shed, or get sick? Okay, sure, God could have created us that way, just as he could have, just as we could get, instead of a real dog, a robot dog, and thus spare ourselves the hassles that come from a sentient, feeling, emotional, and loving creature, as opposed to a mindless, unconscious machine that Sony pawns off as a fun, loving friend. It's obvious God wanted to give us more, and he wanted to get back more. 
despite the potential hassles that he knew would come, hassles that led him to the cross. Catch my point here, okay? That is, rather than create us like robot dogs, he created us as moral beings with the moral capacity to love both him and others. And this moral capacity included freedom, the freedom inherent in the kind of love that only a mortal being could give. You know, Matthew 22, 34 through 40 talks about when Jesus said, what is the most commandment, the most important commandment he was asked? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. And then the second was, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are two famous verses and they're, they're often abused in the sense of being manipulated to accuse, to excuse people from keeping the Sabbath and all the rest. I don't want to get into that. But there's something else here. We are commanded, we are commanded by God to love. Now, that's a little strange in one sense, isn't it? I command you to love me. I command you to love others. If I command you, I command you to love. Can you see yourself saying to your spouse, I command you to love me? Now think about this too, though. God can force you to keep the Sabbath. He can force you not to steal. He can force you not to kill. But God, but to force you to love others or to love him, the first and two most important commandments contain components that absolutely have to be freely given or they can't be given at all. You know, right? Maybe it sounds a little weird to be commanded to love, but yet God could command us to do it, but he cannot force us to do it. It has to be freely given. I mean, we're not talking just outward obedience here. We're talking love. I still remember when my kids were little and my son Zachary did something to his little sister and we said, Zach, you apologize to your sister. And out of the corner of his mouth, I'm sorry. You know, real heartfelt apology. That's not what God is talking about here. You know, again, he could have created us like robot dogs. We could have been obedient and as compliant as these robots. And you know what that would have meant? It would have meant that we, it would have meant that we had never done wrong. It would have meant that Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and all human beings would have never sinned. There never would have been sin. There never would have been sickness. There never would have been evil. There never would have been war, famine, abuse, crime, or death. And you know what else there never would have been? There never would have been Jesus going to the cross because none of these things would have happened. I mean, if the thought, if the thought of having a robot dog who would never soil that would never soil the carpet or chew the furniture or bite someone if that sounds good what about a world without sin death and evil and suffering woo that sounds great doesn't it and god could have done that he really could have just as you now can have a robot dog that won't get fleas or rabies or whatever but if a robot dog doesn't do much for you, then you can understand somewhat why God created us as he did, even at the cost of the cross to himself. 2 Timothy 1, 8, 9 says, Paul writes, Therefore be not ashamed of the testimony of the Lord our God, nor of me as prisoners, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, 
listen to this, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Jesus Christ before time began. Think about that. Before time began? I mean, now, I don't want to get into one of my usual metaphysical, philosophical, cosmological, scientific rifts here. But according to the present understanding of the universe, time had a beginning. That is, time, at least as we understand it, once did exist. Now, I don't understand how any of that works. All I know here is that Paul said that God saved us with a holy courting, calling a, before time began. That was a long, long time ago. God, who knows the future from beginning to end, way in ages past, saw each one of us, each one of us here, and way back then, he purposed to save you and you, all of us, not according to our works. I mean, you didn't exist then to have any works, but according to his grace to save you. So what this implies, is that even before time began, God purposed to save us. That is, he knew what was going to happen. He knew where this freedom that he gave us, beings capable of love, he knew the risk. He knew what was going to happen. Perhaps in the same way, if you get a real dog instead of a flesh and blood, instead of a robot dog, you already know that you risk barking, soiling the carpet, whatever. And yet even before time began, God knew what was going to happen was going to lead him to the cross. But that's how sacred the idea of freedom and love is to God. He was willing to go to the cross to bear in himself the sins of the world rather than create us like robots. Look, I know how hard our lives can be. They can be bitter. They can be filled with sorrow and suffering that we feel we don't deserve. Who hasn't had things happen to them? And you think, I don't deserve this. But all of this suffering, everything everything is, ironically enough, the result of love. Love, true love demands freedom, true freedom. And true freedom demands risk, true risk. The risk was real, sin happened, and the sad millennia of human history testifies to us and the whole universe of what the results of sin and disobedience really are. If you are listening to me right now, then you are somebody in your own way. You have suffered the ravages of sin, not just your own, but someone else's as well. And it's not, and I and it ain't gonna end until Jesus comes back. But the good news is that it will end. That's the whole point of this plan of salvation. It will end and end forever as well. Did you ca- and it's going to end well. Did you catch that last part? It's going to end well. Sure, for all of us, sure, the suffering will end when we die. But really, you know, if our only hope we as human beings have is the, to end suffering is to die, then, well, you know, we're really pathet- pretty pathetic beings in a pretty pathetic situation. Well, my great hope is that one day I'm going to die and all this will be over. Hallelujah. Okay, come on. That's not what God ever intended for us. Even though he knew it was going to come. But why, why when God created us, he knew the future, he knew what was going to happen, and he put the plan of salvation in place. 
even though he knew he would go to the cross as the only way to redeem people he created as free beings. In other words, even though God didn't intend for this to happen, he knew if he created truly free beings, it was going to happen. He saw what was going to happen, but rather than create robot human beings, he created flesh and blood beings like us who could love, even though he knew solving the problem was going to be expensive. How expensive? Well, look at the cross. Look at the cross. That was the cost. That was the cost. The, that was the first coming of Jesus, okay? But, you know, the first coming is incomplete without what? Without what? The first coming is incomplete without the second coming of Jesus. Think about that. Without the second coming of Jesus, what good did his first coming do? I mean, you die, you're in the ground. The first coming of Jesus really is consummated, is fulfilled with the second coming of Jesus. That's when Jesus comes to get what he so dearly paid for at the first coming. And the second coming And that's when each of us, we get a new body in a new heaven and a new earth. In other words, yes, God made us free. He didn't make us as robot dogs. He didn't make Sony Ibo robot humans. You plug us in and we do this and we do that and we do everything. And then the end, you unplug us. No freedom at all, just robots. That's not what he made. Because no matter what Sony says, that dog cannot love you. That dog cannot experience love, experience your love, or love you back. And I know all this talk about artificial intelligence and all that, and I don't think they're ever going to get a computer, a machine, to even begin to feel what we as humans feel. They can act, they can speak, they can talk. They can do all that, but the crucial component is missing, okay? We have this hope, the hope of the second coming of Jesus, where he consummates the first coming, okay? You know, I'm not much of a singer, but I love that song, and I ain't going to sing that for you here. But as I have said before, The surety of the second coming is the first coming of Jesus. Without the second coming, Jesus wasted his time at the first coming. And I don't believe that for a minute. So, yeah, God could have created us as robots, but he didn't, even at the cost of the cross to himself.